friends. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing really well today. My name is Aiden and I'm an educator here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And today we are gonna be having an excellent uh, interview with Dr. Mark Lowen, who's gonna be joining us shortly. And um, if you have a question for us, please, please, please make sure that you press the ask a question button. I know we had questions from Andy's class earlier today that we're going to be asking Dr. Mark Lowen. Good morning, Dr. Mark Lowen. How you doing? I'm excellent, how are you? I'm great. Wonderful. Um, so we are going to be um, having our fun interview, asking a lot of questions. The students all had uh, got to explore a lot of their fossil models today. Um, you and I have not super met in person, but I believe the last time I saw you, you were at the museum itself telling everyone about the new Allosaurus. Um, so would you like to share with everyone the cool things you discovered? Sure. Uh, this year we named a new species of Allosaurus. Um, and we're really excited about it. Um, we recognize this new species of Allosaurus based on differences in the skull. So we could take and look at things like the shape of the skull, looking at its cheekbones, things like that, and tell all the differences between this species of Allosaurus and the older species of Allosaurus, like I have depicted back here. So it's just looking at the bones, just like you guys did today, taking measurements, looking at lots of different fossils and trying to figure out the differences between different bones. Yeah, the, you know, we find a lot of students are really interested in paleontology. What first got you interested in paleontology? Most paleontologists will tell you that they always wanted to be a paleontologist. Um, I was a little bit different. I wanted to be a dinosaur when I was a kid. So paleontology was the, just the next best thing. I also really love dinosaurs and um, I really wanted to work with them and my parents told me that they were all extinct. I got super bummed. Um, but then I became a zoologist and started working with birds. So like I went the other way around. Um, uh, we have um, some really cool questions from that our holdovers from our class today. Um, Jake from Sandy was asking, was Spinosaurus the biggest dinosaur of its time? So everyone who names dinosaurs tries to come up with some est at the end, the biggest, the smallest, the weirdest, the heaviest, the longest. So it turns out Spinosaurus might have been the longest of all the meat-eating dinosaurs that ever lived. So that's exciting. But T-Rex still was heavier. And if they were in a time machine and they could travel across time to meet each other because they didn't even live at the same time, T-Rex is going to win that battle because he outweighs Spinosaurus by at least two tons. You hear that, Jurassic Park 3? Um, I, I also grew up watching a lot of Jurassic Park, and I know a lot of students did, and I can see your super cool hat. Um, I think I have a question of, like, is there something in Jurassic Park that, like, Jurassic Park got wrong that you would like to share with students? Well, most people know this. Um, but Velociraptor really isn't that scary. This is the skull of the largest Velociraptor. You know, it's like a dog. So if you had a stick, you could probably, you know, keep Velociraptor away from you. They made Velociraptor a lot bigger in the movie because they thought it looked a lot scarier. The other thing that they got wrong is Velociraptor has feathers. We're sure of this. So yeah, that's, the, that's one of the biggest things that paleontologists will often tell you. Velociraptors had feathers and are actually much smaller than the raptors in the movie. In the movie, like a lot of the dinosaurs are quite smart. And I know in the movie they try and like add extra stuff to the dinosaurs, but do we know if dinosaurs were smart or not? So in theory, dinosaurs like Velociraptor they had bigger brains than some of the other dinosaurs like T-Rex. But if you've ever spent time with birds, birds are really smart dinosaurs that are still alive today. And some of them are very cunning. Um, I know ravens and magpies are really smart, parrots. So no, they're not as smart as your dog, but they were smart enough to get the job done. Animals are typically as smart as they need to be and not really smarter. Uh, That's right. 
Yeah, it's a good survival yeah. thing. <laughs> um, Grace also had another question during our lesson. Um, she's from Sandy and asks, um, are there any new Ceratopsian fossils found? I know we have a very big collection at the museum. Yes, and let me show you a copy of one. This right here is a copy of a brand new horned dinosaur. This is the back of its head shield. And this still hasn't been named. We're hoping to name this this summer. So if you can come up with a good name, we probably still won't name it that. But yeah, we're still looking for a name. We don't know what we're going to call it yet. I guess I should ask another really good question, which is we've been talking yesterday with Carrie about like what people should do if they find a fossil and where fossils belong. Is that a real fossil or a replica fossil that you have? That's a copy of the real fossil. The real fossil is actually at the museum, but our museum's closed. So I have this copy so I can work on trying to figure out differences between that and dinosaurs like Triceratops and Utahceratops. It's the differences between di different dinosaurs that help us figure out whether they're new or not. Thanks for that answer. I know Grace was really looking forward to that. Um, uh, we have another question also from Abella from California who asks, were there dinosaurs that lived in the water? That's a great question. So some people have said, there's one research paper that suggests that Spinosaurus spent a lot of its time in the water. Spinosaurus has different teeth than any other meat-eating dinosaur in that there's no serrations on the edge. They're not jagged edges. They're actually just cone-like points, and we associate that with animals that eat fish. So certainly Spinosaurus spent a lot of time in the water, but it wasn't an aquatic animal, right? So just because you go in the water to fish doesn't mean you live in the water. There are none of the sea monsters that lived alongside the dinosaurs are actually dinosaurs. Some of them are lizards, other than others are different other kind of reptiles. Crocodiles became sea monsters at the same time, but dinosaurs never became totally aquatic animals. Interesting. What about flying ones? Do they count? So flying reptiles like pterosaurs, which you'll find in every pack of plastic dinosaurs, actually aren't dinosaurs. They're the cousins of dinosaurs that represent a branching of the ancestors between dinosaurs and pterosaurs. So pterosaurs were the first reptiles to take to the air and take over the skies. But very soon after, dinosaurs related to things like Velociraptor started actually taking to the air and flying. So birds, in the end, are the only survivors of the Mesozoic era that actually fly. That's super interesting. Um, I know that there's a lot of other questions we have, but I want to remind everybody that if you have a question, please press the ask a question button. Or if you're tuning in from Facebook, go ahead and leave us a comment because we'd love to hear from you. Don't be shy. You were talking about like the Mesozoic time period. I understand that um, prehistory is broken up into lots of different chunks and that those chunks can be huge expanses of time. Do you have a favorite uh, prehistoric like era? Well, certainly it's the Mesozoic. That's the time of the dinosaurs. You know, if I could go back in a time machine, that's the land I would like to see. Um, I'm also really interested in the time just before the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, that's a lot of some of the work that we do uh, here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. We look at the last 10 million years of the dinosaurs and are really interested in how animals were living before they got wiped out by the giant meteor. Yeah, the I, I know there's a lot of questions about how dinosaurs like went extinct and things like that. Um, and the extinction happened at the end of the Cretaceous, right? That's right. Um, I guess one of the questions that we some of the students ask is, these periods of time are so long. Um, what What would be like, the amount of time between like a stegosaurus and like a t-rex is it like on monday there's stegosaurus on tuesday there's no more stegosaurus and it's t-rex time let's put it this way there's less time between t-rex and you than there is between stegosaurus and t-rex wow that's mind-blowing right that is mind-blowing how much so, time is there between me and t-rex between you and t-rex there's 66 65 million years between you and Stegosaurus, it's 150. 
Whoa. So 150 minus 66 is a bigger number than 66. Math. Um, <laughs> uh, that's very cool. Uh, let's see. We have some student questions coming in. Uh, uh, Luke from California asked, could Spinosaurus actually run 35 miles per hour? Um, we only think there's a couple dinosaurs that actually could run 35 miles an hour. Um, and those are much smaller dinosaurs that are built, I don't know, built really lightly. So what is the fastest dinosaur today? Anybody That's know? what Liz was asking. <laughs> That's the Peregrine Falcon. It can go over 200 miles an hour in a dive. So the fastest dinosaur was some flying dinosaur. And in a dive, it would go really fast. But the fastest land dinosaur are things like the ostrich mimic or nithomimus type dinosaurs. If you remember from Jurassic Park, when all the dinosaurs are flocking and running around Dr. Grant and the two kids. They do move um, like birds. Those are gallimimus. So those are the type of dinosaur that we think are the fastest. And how we figure that out is we look at the ratios of their bones and we look at the muscles, we actually know that T-Rex would have to have half of its body mass in its legs in order to physically go 35 miles an hour, which is impossible. If you look at T-Rex, half of its mass is not in its legs. T-Rex was as fast as it needed to be, right? And not faster. It, it didn't suffer for getting food, uh, but things that T-Rex ate you know, we're so big, they weren't very fast either. Well, that leads into like another good question. Mariana from Salt Lake City asks, how do we know how dinosaurs hunted? Or if they hunted? Well, if you look at T-Rex, let's look at T-Rex. What's he going to do with his arms? I don't know. Another question was, why do they have, why do meat eaters have such tiny arms? So we can fold two questions into one. So T-Rex, you know, you compare it to something like Allosaurus. Allosaurus had longer arms and claws and could actually do things with its arms. T-Rex has taken all of its fighting ability and put it into its skull. It's a headhunter. Literally, it grabs other dinosaurs, you know, with its mouth and shakes them to death. It's hard to do in mirrored screen. So this animal is hunting with its head only. It actually has a much stronger neck and a bigger skull. If you look at the skull of T-Rex, the skull of T-Rex actually can look you in the eye. Can you see how you can see its eye holes? Yeah, yeah. Foot? Other dinosaurs, like this species of Allosaurus, they wouldn't have been able to do that. He can't look you in the eye. Animals that can face forward and look you in the eye have what we call stereoscopic vision, just like us. So our eyes, have an overlapping field of view so you can tell what's closer, what's farther away using that field of view. We associate that with animals that hunt. If you think about a cat versus a cow, a cat has overlapping field of vision, a cow doesn't. Birds that hunt like owls have these overlapping fields of vision. So we know a little bit about, you know, T-Rex could see things in 3D and certainly is built for hunting. How did it hunt? It would grab things with its head and shake them to death. Golly, what a way to go. Um, let's see, we have a bunch more. Uh, uh, Mary from Lehigh asks, why do paleontologists make replicas of fossils? Why would you not? <laughs> That's so cool, right? So, I mean, so, I agree. <laughs> so this replica, this is actually a 3D print of a skull of a very famous T-Rex called Stan. You'll see this one at Thanksgiving Point Museum and other museums around the world. But I couldn't hold the real bones of Stan. So if I want to study it, I use this small 1-6 scale model to actually look at things. And I can hold this and study it and compare it to other bones. So here's the skull of another Tyrannosaur. It's just the snout. This is a Tyrannosaur we named last year. But comparing this with other known animals like this is actually how we figure out what's the same and what's different. Well, that, that leads to a good question um, that uh, my friend Andy from Kansas is asking, which is, um, 
Well, I guess we're going to compound his question and my question. So you said that that's the T-Rex Stan. I'm familiar with the T-Rex Sue. Um, how do you tell male or female dinosaurs, if possible? And then how would you tell the difference of a kid, like a, like a baby dinosaur and an adult dinosaur? How do you know that they're not two separate things, separate species? Yeah, that, that's actually great questions. So I'm going to talk about babies versus adults first. Go for it. One of, one of the things we use is we'll actually look at the bone. And in looking at the bone, we'll look at the surface texture. And with a magnifying glass, you can actually see a different pattern in juvenile bones versus adult bones. And this is because young animals are growing faster than older animals. So we can actually pick that up. And so... You know, we recently found this, this is a skull bone of another Tyrannosaur unnamed from Wyoming. The question was, is this a baby or is this an adult? Because generally we don't want to name babies because they change as they grow up. So just like your kittens are much cuter than your cats, you know, animals change as they grow up. So by looking at these bone surface textures, we can actually figure out how old this animal is. At the same time, if we have a leg bone, here's a femur of a different Tyrannosaur, we can actually look at the cross-sectional cut and we can see tree rings in meat-eating dinosaurs. So we can measure the age of most dinosaurs. I, I believe this dinosaur, Stan, is actually 33 years old, as is the dinosaur, Sue. Um, so looking at the tree rings in their leg bones, we can figure out how old most dinosaurs are. And 33 is the oldest we've gotten. So dinosaurs lived a short life, you know, kind of like Elvis. They went out on top, you know, right at about 33. At the same time, you can tell when a female dinosaur is laying eggs by also looking at those growth rings in the, in the leg bones. So when they're laying eggs, they're taking calcium out of their bones and putting them into the eggshells. So if you get a female dinosaur that died during egg laying season, you can tell that it's female because of those resorption lines. At the same time, we have also found dinosaurs with eggs inside of them. Whoa. So those are the two ways. If you, you can tell if it's egg laying by looking at the cross section of the, of the leg bones or if it has eggs inside of it. Two eggs, man, standard way to tell. Um, there's a bunch more questions. We've actually got one that has to do with um, uh, more T-Rexes. I guess we should say that model you have of Stan, how you said it's so big that like you could not hold it. That is like a scaled down model that you have in your hands, correct? That's right. Okay. The real skull uh -huh. um, is longer than my outstretched arms. Wow. It's huge. huge. And how much does it weigh? A lot. It's also made out of rock, so I imagine That's it's right. much heavier than yeah, bone. It would be impossible. Um, to lift. Impo so you, impossible to lift. For um, a human, yes. Luke from California asks, "What are the holes in the sides of T. Rex's skull for?" So if you look at the this T. Rex skull, uh huh. This hole, this hole right here. Uh-huh. I use my letter opener. This is where the eye goes. Okay. okay. There. This is where it breathes. That's its nose hole. This is just an air sac. This is its sinuses, like we have. And then this hole back here is where the jaw closing muscle goes. Oh so my. the muscle that closes the jaw starts up on top of the skull, goes down through this hole, and connects right here to the bottom jaw. Cool. This dinosaur could bite your leg clean off. Whoa. But the muscle that opens the jaw is just a tiny muscle that goes from right here to right here. So if you were able to get your arms around T-Rex's mouth, you could keep its mouth shut. But if you got your arm inside of there, it would be bad news. Yeah, that reminds me a lot of our modern day alligators and crocodiles. I'm That's from right. Florida and I grew up with a lot of alligators around and Famously, closing alligator mouths, very strong. Opening back up, very weak. Um, and it turns out alligators 
and birds are the closest relatives to dinosaurs. Alligators are the last living things that are representative of the group of archosaurs that dinosaurs and pterosaurs and crocodiles all come from. And then birds actually are dinosaurs that survive to today. I love how they all fit together. Um, Jake from Sandy asks, oh, another Jurassic Park one. This was my favorite Jurassic Park dinosaur. Jake from Sandy asks, does Dilophosaurus actually have poison teeth? And I'm gonna elaborate, Jake, if you'll let me, or like venom and like the frill and like the whole thing. So when you think about animals that have poison, um, what do we think about? We think about snakes, right? If you think about an animal that can spit poison, we would think about something like a spitting cobra, right? I've seen a cobra spit venom for six feet through the air, which is about the same. How do they do that? They have hollow teeth like syringes, and then they have a gland beside their teeth that a little muscle pulls against and pushes the venom out the teeth. If you look at the venom in Jurassic Park, it's like tarry, goopy, like goopy. snot, right? How yeah. do you launch that out of the mouth? So we can actually look at the bones of Dilophosaurus. We don't see any places where there are venom pits. We don't see any hollow teeth. So absolutely, it was not venomous. I mean, Darn. I think we can say that for sure. Creative license. Now, if you think about snakes like a garter snake, uh, garter snakes are actually venomous as well. They don't have hollow teeth, but if you ever get bit by a garter snake, you'll get a little reaction. And what the snake is trying to do is start to digest that flesh in the beginning. So when it bites a mouse, it's starting to rot that mouse down so it can digest it. Um, we think that maybe some dinosaurs could have had very infectious mouths. So if you got bit by it, you would get an infection and things like that, but certainly not venomous. There's no evidence of spitting venom or anything like that. Cool. I mean, it's creative license, right? They put together sure. a fun dinosaur park and wanted to make it cool. Exactly. Um, Justice from North Carolina asks, ooh, a really good one. Do adult dinosaurs always steer, stay near their offspring, their babies, or their eggs? So it's really over the last 40 years that we've understood that dinosaurs took care of their young. There's a famous dinosaur from Montana called Myosaurus. It was actually discovered by the person that um, Dr. Alan Grant is based off of. This paleontologist, cool. Jack Horner, you know, he actually was the first one to figure out that dinosaurs would take care of their young. Since then, we've found dinosaurs sitting on their nests with their wings outstretched, covering their nest. We've found dinosaurs doing all kinds of bird-like behavior. Certainly some dinosaurs um, did not take care of their young, but some of them did. So we don't I, actually um, know all of which ones do which, but certainly those behaviors are present in dinosaurs. That's very cool. I, do we find a lot of dinosaur eggs? And like, if you find a dinosaur egg and there's not a parent fossil around, how do you find out what's inside the egg? Or can we even do that? Unless you have the embryo of the egg, or the egg associated with a parent, you don't know. Oh, okay. But by using, you know, sleuthing technology, you know, finding an embryo, recognizing what dinosaur that's going to grow up to be, then you can actually tell the type of eggshell. We actually know all kinds of different types of eggshells from dinosaurs. So if we have an embryo, we can tie the embryo to the adult, then to the eggshell. And if you find a fragment of eggshell somewhere else, you can tell that that's from that dinosaur. Um, when dinosaurs were first discovered in Mongolia, they found tons and tons of eggs. And they found tons and tons of ceratopsian dinosaurs called protoceratops. So they also found a dinosaur with no teeth. And so they called it Oviraptor phyloceratops, which means I love to eat ceratopsian eggs. But it turns out that all of the eggs were actually from the Oviraptor and not from Protoceratops. Whoa, twist! And even better, 
just like some birds today will go and lay their eggs in somebody else's nest. We found one nest of oviraptors with one different embryo in it. And what do you think the embryo was? Was it a protoceratops? Oh my gosh, it was a velociraptor? Yes. And That's if you know, super cool. You know, so the premise of Dinosaur Train is this happy family of pterosaurs, you know, wakes up with a baby T-Rex in its nest. It doesn't go the same way that Dinosaur Train goes. This no. animal <laughs> probably eats all the rest of them, the poor little baby oviraptors. Yeah, I think uh, I think Dinosaur Train also takes some creative liberties, though I do love that <laughs> show a lot. Um, we have a bunch of other questions. Ooh, some very specific questions. Alexander from Salt Lake City asks, do you support the Triceratops is Taurosaurus theory? Um, I think we have some good evidence that's going to be coming out soon that Taurosaurus is a distinct dinosaur from Triceratops. And even if Triceratops is Taurosaurus is true, which it isn't, it would be Taurosaurus is Triceratops because Triceratops was named first. Okay, that makes some sense. So, but the, the, the idea is Triceratops starts off as a baby and changes as it grows up. And then eventually it becomes Taurosaurus when it's the very oldest stage of adulthood. Um, so the test of that is, can we find a baby Taurosaurus or a huge adult Triceratops. And I think we have found that. That's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, I have, I'm gonna give you one more question for my friend Florian from Austria. And then we, I have to ask you about the dinosaur quarry. So Florian from Austria asks, have you ever found or described a species of Crocodilomorpha? And maybe some description of what a croc what crocodilomorpha is would be helpful. So crocodiles are animals that are like crocodiles. And I have found several, um, but other people are working on them. Um, I have so many dinosaurs to work on right now. Um, you can't work on everything. Yeah, you have only so much time. And these fossils require a lot of attention to detail, right? Right. Um, I have to ask, because we've been conducting our exploration of Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, um, I have to ask, what do you think happened at the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry? So one of the problems with the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, as you know, is you don't find skeletons like this. You find just a bunch of bones jumbled around, you know, more like this. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, when you look closer, there are animals that are kind of together. So our Ceratosaurus was found in one spot. We have five Stegosaurs that are found pretty much together in one spot. So it's really consistent with bodies falling apart. So of course, from the beginning, everybody thought, you know, wow, is this a predator trap where they're getting stuck in the mud? Is it like La Brea tar pits? But actually, to me, it's more consistent with what I've seen in floods of the Mississippi and Missouri River, in which the water backs up onto the floodplain, dead animals will float together in a circle, and then slowly start to rot and rain down bones on the bottom of the shallow water. And that's what I'm, I'm convinced that that's what's going on at this quarry. So they died in the flood upstream, floated downstream, came together in that one place. Those floodwaters receded, but the quarry persists as a lake for a long time after the dinosaurs were deposited in the bottom. We have, you know, in some places, three feet of lake deposits that are like the bottom of the Great Salt Lake of little bits of mud falling down through the water column and settling to the bottom of the lake. So a lot of things say it's rotting carcasses coming apart in a lake. Bloat and float, yeah? Yep. Um, that's very cool. Well, friends, um, let's see. We are just about out of time today. Maybe let's see. We have one more time for one more question. Dr. Mark Lowen, what is your favorite dinosaur? I think my favorite dinosaur is Ceratosaurus. Um, he's got a horn on his nose. He's got the longest, thinnest teeth of any meat-eating dinosaur. He's got, he's the only armored meat-eating dinosaur. He's got a row of armored 
from the tip of his neck down to the base of his tail. So yeah, he's pretty cool. He does sound very cool. Um, well, friends, thank you so much for joining me today. Dr. Markle, and thank you so much for being here. You super rule. Um, <laughs> uh, we have class tomorrow, same time, same channel, 9.30 Mountain Daylight Time. Andy will be leading us on a continuation of our exploration of the mysteries at Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. Um, scientists, friends, teachers, parents, please feel free to leave us some feedback. We're trying to help provide distance learning initiatives and serve you as best as we can. So please let us know how we're doing. Um, this Friday, we're gonna have a special interview at 9.30 Mountain Daylight Time with record-setting astronaut Scott Kelly at 9.30, I think I just said that, at 9.30 Mountain Daylight Time. Um, so be sure to tune in for that on Friday. And thank you again, Dr. Lowen. Uh, thank you so much for being here. You super rule. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time. Bye. Bye.